right. Hello, Idiots on Parade, the Too Ugly for TV podcast, bonus podcast. I am Nathan Timmel, uh, mouth clown in Iowa. That's Barrett Antar Goodwin, musician in Philadelphia. Hi, Barrett. Hey, how are you, sir? Uh, we are two friends that have known each other for more years than should be legal. And yes. we talk to each other and we record it. And then we put put it out into the universe and expect magic to happen. <laughs> it's like a new age hippie shit. It's it's our yeah. I'm looking at myself, I'm noticing I took a shower and washed my hair. I did a I did a um what did I do? Isolation chamber, uh, a pod, a float. I floated today. Mm-hmm. That was fantastic. Oh, how was that? Did oh, you I love float? it. I, yeah. It's December uh, 9th as we record. And last year for Christmas, my wife got me a three pack and this was the last one of my three pack. I really spaced them out. Um, yeah, it, it, I absolutely love it. Have you ever done a float before? Yeah, but I did it twice. Once in a cool place and once in like some place in the city where it was like goofy. Like they put you in basically literally like a little pod. And that's kind of gross. No. You know, but I went to a really cool one in Woodstock. There was one in Woodstock that I went to that was amazing. Um, yeah, that was really cool. But the one in the city was kind of gross. But um, anyway, yours was sounded good. Yeah, I went to a nice sanitary place. I muted myself while you were talking. Water heater just kicked on, so I'm not sure how much uh, shh will be in the background. Um, <laughs> all right, so... I know what I want to talk about this week. Or I know what I want to start with, and I kind of know where I want to go. I'm just not sure how we'll get there. No. Um, I want to start. We got an interesting comment on our discussion from two weeks ago. Okay. And it had me thinking. Um, two weeks ago, we were talking about artistic mindsets in a way, and you had mm-hmm. said, and I agreed with, that for musicians and comedians, we both sort of said, to, to youngsters, if you can do anything else with your life, do it. You know, this has to be a calling because if other, it's, it's going to beat you down. It's going to break your heart. Any artistic endeavor kind of sucks. And I had a friend, I have a friend, uh, a teacher who commented on it. And he said, I tell the same thing to people that want to get into teaching. The exact same yeah. thing. Absolutely. And what that made me think of is I, I do not think we were being this way, but the artistic mind tends to fall down this path or, or go down this path of we think we're different and or better than others. Right. Sure. Yeah. The idea that, yeah. Oh, I'm so artistic. I'm a musician. I need a muse. I write songs. I'm a, I'm a comedian. I, I have these ideas. I impart wisdom through humor. And it's not true because you and I have had, we, we had a talk about this off air. We didn't record it, but my wife has, has a friend or knows someone, or someone, her dermatologist, not dermatologist, but someone that works in skincare. And when I talked to this woman, she was so passionate about skincare that I was enthused. And my friend's comment about teaching, it, it basically made me think of city slickers. What's the secret of life? One thing. When you figure that out, nothing else means shit. And everyone needs to follow their own calling. I remember being interviewed yes. once um, and they're asking what it's like to be a comedian. And I told them in a very plain way without complaining the good and the bad. And I don't remember how it came around, but I said, this is what I chose to do. So to complain about it would be pointless. If I had chosen to be a dentist, well, then I'm certain that at some point a dentist would shut up, set up shop across town and offer a coupon, and then I would be complaining about that. I'd be saying, oh, that dentist is stealing my page, whatever. Anybody has a right to complain about everything, and yes. I don't know why artists somehow think that they're better or different or that they have an exclusive right to, you don't understand, this is who I am. Well, an accountant can be an accountant, you know? What, what are your thoughts? I mean, one, I, I, I hear where you're coming from and I agree with, your, with the person who left the comment. I do think that arguably most things, most things people should only do because they have a calling, you know? Like uh, if you're a doctor, like when you meet doctors who are passionate about medicine versus doctors who are, well, I mean, 
I don't know. They must all be to a degree because I think medical school is really hard, and I don't think there's easier ways to make money, you know. But but I think that the doctors who are passionate about medicine are much more. They're really good. Like at least in terms of the doctors that I've interacted with, the ones who really seem to love what they do versus the ones who maybe are just burnt out. There's it is a, there's a very different thing there. I would say the thing about music that makes it weird is, or music or comedy or any one of the kind of wait staff jobs, you know, the, the jobs, you know what I mean? like, I don't say that in a mean way, but like, you know, like those jobs, right? The ones that like everybody, like they wait tables while they're doing, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, like it, actors it, that the the they you don't mean like waiters right. and waitresses. You mean people that I'm going to Hollywood right. to make it, but everyone's right. exactly an, everyone's right. an actor, right. but they're waiting tables, right? Right, exactly. I mean, and I don't mean that in any mean way. No, no, no. You I just mean, mean it, but like, it like, took me a second like to get people, where you were going. Right. Like people have a side hustle to support. They have a benefactor, and the benefactor is the restaurant they work for, the bar they bartend at, or the music store they work in, or the lessons they teach, or whatever it is. You know what I mean? But I think it's different in a way because to do this successfully, you have to be able to really self-govern, right? Like it's easy to go to your job, no matter how hard your job is. And I, I don't mean that, I know people have really hard jobs and it sucks, right? But like in general, when you go show up somewhere and your job is to, you get told what to do, and you get a guaranteed paycheck, and you have a mandatory lunch break, and you have all these things structured for you. So basically, your only responsibility is show up to work and don't fuck up, basically, right? In a, in, in a very simple sense, right? I'm sure it's more than that. Yeah. But in a simple sense, that's what it is. But it really, the hardest part about being a musician for me is not... It's the it's the wake up at eight o'clock and work as hard as I would for somebody else. You know, it's that. It's putting in the eight, nine, ten hour work day for myself, but really working as hard as you I'd be working if I was working for somebody else. That's the hardest part for me. And that's the part I think is hardest for most people that I know. It's not whether or not they're good at their job, it's whether or not they're good at all the other stuff that in most other jobs there's a support system to do there's hr people and there's this person and this person and there's this person there's a whole support system so they kind of what you have to focus on is your job to a degree i mean obviously lots of people feel unsupported at work you know what i mean right like i, I you know in this fucking pc world i can't say shit without having to correct myself or somebody gets well my job so you know what i mean <laughs> Well, I, I held up two fingers because I had two thoughts. Now I have three because I said, uh, I know where I want to go. And you accidentally stumbled across it. Um, we won't get there yet. I'll start with my two thoughts because they relate to what you were saying. Um, one, as far as being your own boss and working hard for yourself, you made me think of this, the, the great recession of 2008. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had a lot of friends, and again, with COVID, um, people just losing their jobs. 2008 more yeah. so, because the, the COVID thing was, and again, this is not meant in any form of disrespect, because I've been there, uh, the, the service industry, whereas 2008 was, I mean, people thought they had careers. They, they, they worked yeah. as, as I, the aforementioned accountant and or whatever a career might be, and that just wiped out people. They, they, they just got laid off. And it was interesting because as people were getting laid off, I was thinking, well, this is what my life is. I am perpetually laid off. I am constantly right. searching for work. I am looking at an empty calendar saying, how can I fill this weekend? How can I fill this? You know, I'm, yeah. I'm perpetually unemployed. So I thought that was interesting. The second thought I had was as far as working 10 hours every day, I had a friend that was a photographer. And how do I put this gently or maybe I don't have to be gentle. I'll just say it as is one. He had a problem with turnaround. 
when you when you're a wedding photographer, you take all the pictures on a Saturday, and then you promise the uh, bride and groom, the the people, a set date for your photo your your pictures. And he would promise something like six, eight weeks, two months, and then as far as I remember, he started missing deadlines, and his work dwindled. And I remember him saying at one point. I don't remember how it came up, but he said, well, you know, Sunday and Monday is kind of like my weekend. I work all day Saturday, so I, I take Sunday and Monday off. And I found that very interesting because I'm like, your whole life is a weekend. If you take all the pictures on a Saturday, sure, you, you can always take a coffee break. Why not get up Sunday and just bang for eight, 10 hours and get that done and give it to them on, I, I, I'm not a photographer, but... I, mean, I know photographers, it's work. Yeah. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying if you sit down and edit for 10 hours, you can bang out. All you have to do is go through and go, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And then when you take 500 and dwindle it down to 100, and then you Photoshop and correct and color correct, and, and, and it takes a lot of work, but you can I mean, do that work, in a day or two and turn it around. I mean, well, I mean, it's like anything. It's, it's, it's work, and it might be hard, but it's not... It's more like it's it's in it's it's a lot of attention to detail, mm -hmm. right? Like I get why people don't want to do it, but it's true. It's just a certain amount of hours. You know what I mean? Right. It's like it's like that's what I like. You know, like during COVID. Like I'll say this: it's funny, two thousand eight, I was actually doing great because I was playing in churches and bars. <laughs> That's the two things people did during a, during a recession is they went to church and they went to drink. I yep. actually did quite well. It's not really funny, but it's kind of amusing. It is. <laughs> like, but uh, It but was 12 years long. ago. We can laugh right. about people's misery now. Well, right. Like exactly. the Holocaust. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, That'll get me but, canceled. You know I mean? But like... But but it, it there is something to be said for being used to insecurity. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Not insecurity, but being used to the idea that if you don't do this, you won't eat. You know, because I'll bet you if that same photographer worked for a wedding photographer and he had the same exact job, he just had a boss who said, here's what you have to do, and I need this stuff. I need those 100 shots we're going to use by Tuesday. You know, and then, you know, and maybe he'd wait till Monday to do it, but it'd get done by Tuesday. You know yeah. what I mean? And then some like all he like, that's what most people need is a boss. They just need somebody to whip them in shape so they can do the things they know they need to do. Because knowing how to do knowing you need to do something often doesn't come with an instruction manual. You know what I mean? Like knowing you want to get your finance together doesn't make you automatically know how to do that like knowing you want to to get in good shape doesn't give you the skill set to automatically do that and i think knowing that you need to get work done is the same like most people just need directions and a boss you know that's what i've learned and my struggles is that i really just need to be like i had to learn how to be my own boss and it wasn't easy it wasn't easy at all you know? because what i'm hearing you say i'm going to translate it is there's accountability. If you yeah. have a boss, there is accountability. You will get fired. You will get written up. You will get a reprimand. You will get a, you know, you will be put on double secret probation. Whereas if you were, are your own boss, then you can create excuses over and over and over. You do not, it's very difficult to hold yourself accountable for anything. Yeah. Most people enjoy if something happens to them, not enjoy, that's a bad word, but and I'm guilty of this, where if something happens, it's easy to brush it off, point a finger, and lay blame that it is to right. examine your accountability in the situation. I mean, and let's be honest, right? I'm self-employed, and I give my boss hand jobs, so he pretty much does whatever I want, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Me too. Right, like at the end of the day, it's like, I, it's, it, it's like a weird thing. Like it was hard for me for a long time to learn to invest in myself 
because I know kind of what a piece of shit I am. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of know when I fuck around, when I don't fuck around, and when I'm an asshole, and when I'm passive-aggressive, and I know all the worst stuff about me, which means that, like, ultimately, as much as I liked myself, I didn't necessarily respect myself, right? If that makes any sense. So mm-hmm. I wasn't really investing in myself. I started to have to do things to earn my own respect. And once I earned my own respect, right, started like living more true to who I wanted to be and doing the things that like looking around at the people I do respect and be like, well, why do I respect them? Oh, well, then that's what I need to do. And just doing those things that gave me the once i started respecting myself i started actually investing in myself more it was actually a really interesting thing because i had to figure it out like i was like why don't i invest in myself even though i want to and i know i need to right why won't i like what stops me why do i self-sabotage it is because i didn't respect myself because i didn't i wasn't doing the work necessary like I, i'd look at the people i did respect and i'd see the work they were doing and i wasn't doing that you know it was an yeah. interesting thing you know it was an interesting an interesting realization you know well, i mean you make me confront my own past where i have i've made it very clear that i fucked up my time in los angeles where mm-hmm. i didn't network because it, 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 i was arrogant in a way and that I thought what you did on stage mattered. Mm-hmm. Where I would see people that told uh, very, in my opinion, and you know, I'm being judgmental, basic jokes, but they would hang out at the club all night, every night. And the next thing you know, there was this little gang that once one of them moved forward, it all just happened. Whereas I was like, all right, I'm done. I'm going home. And maybe I was viewed as standoffish or whatever it is. I just thought that all you did was get on stage, tell the jokes, and someone would go, all right, kid, you're good. Let's do something. Yeah, right. Like, if you're funny, like, all you had to do is be funny. Yeah. 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 You know. thing kicked on again, so I muted as you said something uh, and I tried to acknowledge, but. Well, I will say, I'll say this, too. I'll say that part of it is, I think, if you think about the the British invasion, right? All, all those guys were friends with each other. Like they were all friends. It was one massive clique of Britain's kind of blues guitar players. And then the bands all knew each other and the Stones and the Beatles were hanging out and Hendrix was chilling over here and the animals were doing this. And there's, you know what I mean? Let me interrupt quickly because that's yeah. one of the things I've, I read Keith Richards' book and I've read other the 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 Beatles Stones uh, rivalry was completely invented in the by the press and, and the Beatles and Stones let it happen because they knew they 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 sort of conspired and said hey they're saying we hate each other like well does it make you know no is it notoriety is it good news fine let them say it so yeah they were mm-hmm. friends. Absolutely. But the press had them hating each other, and they're like, all right, Absolutely. as long as they're talking about us, great. Yeah. And I think there's something that happens when you see your friends become successful. It, it almost gives you permission to do the same thing in a certain way, right? There's like, like they call it, I was reading a book, and they called it genius, not genius. Like there's scenes, and in the scenes, in a healthy artistic scene, the people, there's friendly competition. And people like, you know, like you might go down to the club and see your friend do a joke, like, man, that's good. Woo. And then when you're thinking about writing, you're like, okay, well, that's the bar now, right? And then so you write something that's really killing. And then somebody sees that and then they're so they go, man, Nate just crushed it tonight. Shit, that's the new bar. And then they, then somebody else, you know, and it's really healthy. And I think that that's what they had in that all that British invasion stuff. There was a healthy kind of rivalry and friendship and they learned from each other and collaborated and did stuff. And I think the same thing happened here in like during in San Francisco during the um, like with the Grateful Dead and Sly and the Family Stone and I, like all those. It was actually with the instant you said it happened here. I thought Bob Dylan because the whole folk scene right. was with Absolutely. Jane Mitchell and every, they just right. they, they everybody. Yeah, yeah, right. Like she's singing a song 
and Levon Hellman, the cats from the band, hear it and go, can we do that? And then they're like, yeah, sure. She's like, okay. And it becomes, you know, like, right. It's just like, that's what they did. They didn't have, it was a very different world. It wasn't, they were competitive, but they were also really were collaborative in a way that I find rare today. You know, I find, and they would hold each other accountable, right? Like, because they were bands, they held each other accountable to a degree, right? Like, like in a comedy troupe, you know, an improv group, you have a, you have people depending upon you to do something, which gives you more momentum sometimes than you might have to do it for yourself. You know, like it's weird. I think we're wired fucked up. You know? You're making me sad because I remember <laughs> having that. <laughs> like, right. I lived in Milwaukee right. when I was just getting started. There were three of us yeah. that would just sit in a car and drive an hour to do an open mic. And we just talk and bullshit and talk and bullshit. And, you know, then, then we go on stage and then we critique on the drive back and talk about what worked and tag. And, and, uh, you know, my buddy would, uh, Hey, I got this idea. I'd be like, ah, but this guy does that. Oh, okay. You're like, I used to have that. And it's just gone. And I bet there are young yeah. comics out there that kind of have that. I bet there are open mic scenes and I, there are probably musicians out there that have that too, that have jam sessions. Absolutely. We're fucking old and out of touch. Well, but well, I mean, I think the thing is this, right? Like if I played jazz music still, I think that that kind of mentorship or or camaraderie exists in jazz. When I, I will say this, when I was doing the New York thing, when I was a, a working New York musician, and all my friends were also, our hang time was work time and play time. And it, there was a lot of community. Because when I was in the house band for a jam session, that was like, it was just a cool place to be in the village on a Tuesday night or whatever. And so, like we started on Monday, then it went to Tuesday, and then there was another. It just got out of hand after a while. But but while we were doing it, it was just everybody would come by after their gig. We'd go till three, four in the morning. It was ridiculous, but it was really fun. And that was a crazy period, and that was arguably one of the periods that I learned the most about myself as a musician. Right, like playing with the same cats three, four times a week, different configurations. Like we were the backup band for many, many different kinds of people. And they were just in that kind of camaraderie. I did that again with my friends, Gabe and Drew and Kurt was there. So we would did that a lot and we backed up a bunch of different artists and did stuff, man. Those were some of the, it's true. Those were some of the best times, like some of the best times, some of the, some of the times with the most growth, they weren't always the best times like economically or for other reasons, but in terms of for, artistic growth they were the best oh my god so good i was just so gonna good. say do you think either of us is doing that dangerous thing where we romanticize the past not not from a not from a a, a skill acquisition standpoint no yeah. like i don't say that i made the most money during those times i mean i made a living but right. you know i wasn't like it wasn't necessarily from an emotional standpoint, the best time, but from an artistic growth standpoint, by far. I mean, Katie and I have a similar kind of relationship, you know, where we write together a lot and we play a lot. When we were playing a lot, when that, when we, before COVID, we were playing a lot, that was all, there was an amazing amount of growth because we really stretch out on stage. And because of that, every gig is, is, is new and exciting even though we were playing the songs we played before it's like a jazz gig in that sense and then you know if you're out on the road with the same band for two and a half weeks you know you really like think like magic happens you know like you have these really intense magical moments that that don't happen when at least not for me all the time when the gig is just a like when everybody's there just for their paycheck Right. A bunch of great musicians what? playing really good, playing well. It doesn't sound bad, but but nobody's looking for magic. You know what I mean? Like I won't go into you know. I won't go into details, but I, you know, you and I know I saw you on a gig like that, where mm -hmm. you and, and Katie, and for anybody that's first time here, Katie Henry Band. That's uh, Barrett's the musical director, and and in so if you look up Katie Henry Band on Spotify, Apple Music, you'll know what he's talking about. Um, 
I saw you do a gig where you had to travel. So you picked up, and again, I'm not going to really throw anybody under the bus. I won't be specific. I'll, you had to pick up a couple of musicians to complete the yeah. band. And I watched you guys rehearse and they were sort of like, yeah, we got it. We're good. You know, like we're old hands. We're pros. We do this for a living. Don't worry about it. You know? And then you guys got on stage and I sat there and I was visibly annoyed. Not that anybody was looking at me. I was annoyed. And after the gig, you and I, walked out to have a private moment and we had this this moment i don't know if you remember we're in the parking lot and we both said the same thing at the same time which was that one fucking musician and you know yeah. again, i won't say which one or his name but right. I, i'm like that was supposed to be the linchpin and that was the guy I was like no i got it we're good we don't need to rehearse again and i remember the rehearsal you were like should we do this again and katie was like should we do this again he's like well we can but and and yeah and, and not to blame you or Katie, but that could have been the moment where you said, you know what, we're in charge. Yes, we're going to rehearse no, again. That's exactly, that was, that's the thing, right? Here's the, the problem is, is learning the job on the job sucks, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right. Because I was under the, they wanted the music well, well in advance. We got them all the music and I got something in my eyeball. Um, they wanted the music, they got it. I asked what they wanted charts. Like we did everything on time. We got there. They had already said they ran it a bunch. They were familiar with it. They'd done their homework. We got into the rehearsal. They had kind of done their homework, but they were pros. Like they could all play. So yeah. it was like, all right, I've been, I've been this guy before. Like you're just going to go up on stage and you're going to kind of half-ass the the details but you're gonna nail the broad strokes and the fact that you're a good musician is gonna get you by can you hear all that in the background i was just gonna ask what that is yeah it's uh yeah hey keep it down in there um here let me give you an um, example that uh uh yeah. doesn't throw uh, anyone you know under the bus it's like when you see sting without the police and he does police songs because he hires the best musicians sting does not you know just hire people yeah. off the street but there's some they the drummers don't do what stuart copeland does like they, yeah. they just, they'll miss little hi-hat trills or they don't have the you know mini splash and so when they just hit a cymbal you hear, I mean, people that aren't musicians won't be able to describe it, but they can hear that something's wrong because they just know it's off just enough. And yeah. so when you're saying that they, re yeah. yeah, they were professional. So in my mind, what I was thinking is like, they're like, yeah, yeah, we got this. And what they're doing is like, okay, it's in the key of C. Great. So I'll just fuck around in the key of C. Okay. But that's not what the song is. The C right. is a song in the key of C, but it is a song. It has these notes and they absolutely. just sort of, they did yeah. under the umbrella, but not the specifics. Right, absolutely. And, and here's what I will say, is I used to do the exact same thing. You know, I used to do the same thing. I like, oh, so many people an apology, because like I would get on their gig, and they'd be paying me good money, and I would have done the broad strokes, but not even gotten close to the details. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I'd get through the gig, and I'm a, I'm a likable enough guy, and I'm good enough to do some stuff, and and then I'll and I kill one or two of the tunes, and I have decent ideas, so they keep me around because you know it's like on balance, it's worth it. But like the minute I stopped living like that, and actually was the guy who showed up and did his homework and shit, my life changed drastically. You know, like in terms of the kind of gigs I had access to, all of a sudden and the people who called me and the opportunities that showed up, like everything changed, you know? And, and, and that it was that same thing, right? Like, why do I, why do I show up to do this music thing and half-ass it, even though I love it? Like, I love music. So why do I treat it so badly? Like, you know what I mean? I have an answer for that. This goes all the way back to where this started. Do you think, and this is just a question, because I've had that mindset in the past too, and with me it was, 
and this is years ago, and I'm so glad I got out of this mindset. Uh, this is a shit gig. I don't care. Fuck it. Yeah. And now, and I remember seeing another comic do that, and it really mm-hmm. stamped me out of it. And I'd see comics that go on stage at shit gigs and go, oh, my career's really taken off. I'm in dumb fuck wherever. And so I started getting up on stage and going, hey, everybody, thanks for coming out. I know we're in the middle of nowhere, but you're here, I'm here, let's have fun. And once I started treating every gig as not important, like I'm going to be a star or someone's going to discover me, but treating it as if, fuck, I may be in the middle of nowhere, but these people came out and I would like to make them laugh. So do you think think that you had a bit of... um, why does that keep fucking firing up? Jesus goddamn Christ. Can you hear that every time it fires up? No. Every five fucking minutes. I have minutes no idea what on. you're talking about, actually. Okay, good. Uh, I don't know how much the microphone will pick up, but... Uh, so do you think that you... And I'll, I'll, I'll paint broad strokes here. Say you were in a wedding band and some of the shitty pop tunes of the day and you're like, ah, fuck it, these songs suck. I'm not going to learn these. And that was your attitude? Like, it goes back to what I said, the artistic mindset. I'm above this. And when you think you're above that, you fuck up or you shoot yourself in the foot. I mean, yes, but it, 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 I think it's ultimately the exact opposite, right? <clears throat> I think it's, I think one, it's very hard to see yourself objectively, right? Like it's very difficult to see oneself objectively, I think, right? But I also think that there is a, in my case, there was a, a, a gross sense of entitlement that I hadn't actually earned because shitty things happened to me in my childhood and shitty things happened in my teen years and shitty things happened in my late teen years. And, you know, I kind of figured like, well, there needs to be some kind of retribution for all the shitty things that happened, which will obviously come in the form of success, right? (laughs) Of course. And so I think I showed up and I kind of knew that I was decent. The problem was, in my mind, I was as good as I could be not as good as I actually was. Do you know what I mean? Like in my mind, I was potential fulfilled. And in reality, I was just potential. You know, <laughs> if that makes sense. You know? And I, 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 there was a really stupid belief that I had that was if I had to work as hard as everybody else, then I wasn't actually like, I didn't have natural talent because natural talent shouldn't have to work this hard. I don't know where I got that from. Probably just lots of dumb magazines of, you know, like, you know, Prince spent his time like fucking nine hours a day. And it's like, you read the interviews with the, with the, the, kid, who, the kid whose house he played at every day. His, the mother's like, those boys are so crazy. They spent every waking hour in that room practicing and practicing and writing songs and writing songs and practicing and practicing. They didn't date any women. They didn't do any of that shit. They did. But, but you read the stories that, they, that it was all about partying and hanging out. It's like, okay, well, then that's what you do. And you play music and you jam and it's like stupid and childish. You know what I mean? It's just a childish approach to it. And it took me a while to undo my own sense of like, I deserve this gig. I shouldn't have to. I don't know. Again, I'm not sure exactly where it came from. Like again, stupid TV shows. You know what I mean? Like I think it's whatever it is, you know? I think it's every young person's arrogance. I think when you're in your teens and 20s, you're fucking stupid and arrogant. I mean, I, th- yeah, I think that's just a natural yeah. thing for all of us. Yeah, and, and it's a real problem because when they say youth is wasted on the young, a better way of saying that is that you're only in your prime once, you know? And you have to really hope that your intelligence catches up before your knees give out. You know, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Did you come up with that? 
<laughs> just now. That's goddamn <laughs> brilliant. That's a <laughs> fucking Confucius says right there. That that's is. really like you, that's that's the problem. But but in the the in the in most people's lives, they coincide at the same exact time. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I I worry that I'm on that goddamn path every day. And I, and I say this, I mean, with humility. I bet in my twenties I said this with arrogance, but in in humility, I I I believe I'm growing and developing as a comedian. And I get on stage and audiences tell me, yeah, you're pretty good. And, and I go, huh, I, I think I'm pretty good. But then I also look at what defines sex, sex, <laughs> what defines success and go, oh, yeah, I failed. Like, like, are my knees going to give out before <laughs> I do achieve a modicum of I don't even know what you want to call it, notoriety or what I've always told you, not fame, but ease where yeah. right now the industry is based on, have you been on TV? No, but I will, your customers will want to come back. They will say, I had a good time at your club, comedy club. Yeah, but you haven't been on TV. The, the, the barriers are in the wrong place in my opinion. And though I can do the job, I, I worry that, I won't be able to do it much longer just because I'm a nobody and that scares the shit out of me. Yeah. 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 And I think it's changing a little bit, but I think that in order to ride the wave, it, at least for me, it takes a sense of understanding that I don't understand and humbling myself enough to take advice from young people who, who grew up in this world and really get it. You know, like I, I, I'm taking this some Instagram course, like how to maximize your Instagram stuff. And like the guy teaching has got to be 22. You know what okay. I mean? Once you figure it out, start posting our our conversations on it. Exactly. Right now, you're Mister. Like, I want to keep my Instagram separate. Fucking, we need to promote exactly. this shit. I know, I'll do it. But but you know what I mean. Like like, I, it, but it takes a lot for me to listen to a twenty or two year old who makes statements that sound like questions. You know what I mean? Like, and then you do this, and then you do this. I'm like, are you asking me or telling me? It's like you know. <laughs> what is going on here but his information is really good he's just like a young person who doesn't really know how to deliver the content he knows the information he just has you know and they've done tons of videos but it's just there's something that the 10 years of experience gives you you know what i mean there's just something that happens when you have 10 years of experience versus three or four years worth of experience right. There's just something that happens when you've been in the game for 15 years. You know what I mean? <laughs> that like you, like you, it's like I, I heard somebody say, I heard somebody, I, heard, I saw a quote and then somebody said it today, uh, same exact thing, which was, I'll take a person with experience over a person who's read a lot of books, right? And then I was talking to somebody and they were talking about how experience really will teach you significantly more than the books will like the book will teach you something but when you go through that thing that's when you really learn the lesson <laughs> you know well, that's when I mean, it really this is home, you know? this is stupid but i i hear you it's you can read every book in the world on divorce and heartbreak but yeah. until you get crushed in a relationship it's all conjecture yeah, it doesn't yeah, love songs don't make any sense until you've actually had the experience. <laughs> you know, like the heartbreak. So you listen to those old heartbreak songs, you listen to the blues. It's like, why is blues music for old people? Because young people don't have them yet. Those young people who get the blues, I feel bad for them. They're not supposed to get it. You know what I mean? Like if you're 15 years old and you, you can hear what Howlin' Wolf is talking about, you've lived a tough life, man. That's not good. <laughs> you shouldn't know that at 15. You know? <laughs> when you hear Billie Holiday at 12 and you get it, it's like, that's a problem. 
<laughs> anyway, you said you had something else you wanted to talk about, and then we went all well, sideways and shit. <laughs> yeah, you actually uh, you hinted at it, and I'm uh, we're gonna hold this place right here as sort of an edit point because I didn't prepare. Mm -hmm. I should have uh, done something in advance, but I didn't. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen with you. And if it looks good, I'll leave it in the video. And if not, I will edit it in on, um, I, will, I will edit it in to the video. Because you said earlier uh, about having a support system and HR, and then you said, um, <laughs> I can only, <laughs> now he's potty let's turn that off. I said, fuck these goddamn liberals. I can't say shit anymore without them. Coming after yeah, you. I'm gonna have to edit a this. little of this. Yeah. Okay, now, I should have prepared. Come with an God apology. Damn it. Well, it'll give me an there opportunity to. Uh, All right, drink so my tea. let's pause. Okay. All right, so we'll edit some of this out and share screen. Let's get this up here. Share my screen with you. So you're talking about HR, and I had an interesting week. I lost a gig uh, yesterday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got hired uh, to do a Zoom gig for an IT group. And so what happened was after I got hired, they apparently put out, we're having a comedian come to our Zoom. Uh, you know, we're having a Friday blowout, and we'll have a comedian, and he'll tell jokes. Well, uh, when they put it out there, Someone apparently went to my YouTube page, found a joke, and sent it to HR and said, I think he's uh, offensive. I think he's sexist. And so HR contacted me and said, we need to talk about uh, your set. And I said, absolutely. So we talked and he said, yeah, it's got some feedback. On, on, they went to your YouTube page and uh, we're worried about some of your sexist material. I'm like, oh, I don't think I have any, but go ahead. And he told me this joke and let's play it for you and either it'll work or I'll edit it into the VOD, the, the VOD, the VODcast, the video. So let's hit uh, share screen. Joke. Uh, let's, let's try a weather joke. Uh, we have snow coming tomorrow, snow apocalypse just hit the, the east coast. They said that New York City was going to get uh, about eight inches of snow, eight inches. Ooh. And then they got around five inches of snow. And you know what? That's why I think every meteorologist should be a woman. Because if a woman tells you you're getting eight inches, God damn it, you are getting eight inches. Yeah. Yeah. Only a man will tell you when you're getting eight inches what he means around five. That's what he means. Yeah. So, no, I wasn't told who complained about that joke, but here's my problem is they weren't complaining about the use of the word goddamn, which I'm like, yeah, I won't swear in a corporate gig. Don't worry. They said it was sexist. And I said, it, I thought it was very pro-woman. In fact, I'm making fun of men. And the HR guy get, get, went, uh, oh, uh, no, no, just no. You, you, you can't. That's just sexist. It's wrong. And I'm like, wow. And then we proceeded to have a conversation about how that joke, he said, you're going to offend people. I said, okay, well, I won't do that joke. He's like, yeah, but are your jokes that racy? And I'm like, I, am I in a no-win <laughs> situation here? Because I am, I, that's one of the least offensive jokes I have. And I don't think I do offensive jokes, really. That, uh, and so, do you, do you still do that joke? No, that and that's the fucked up thing is that <laughs> I'm not going to pull it up again. But I, when I, I searched that joke out, ago. it was I can't remember what page it was on, but they had to scroll to find it. I'm sure they had to scroll past things that might have been considered more offensive than that because that is a pretty tame joke. But then, so we had this conversation, and yeah. and I could tell it was going south when we signed off. He was just very defeated, like. I, you don't understand. This is uh, this is very sensitive, and this 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 offensive material will not work in this situation. And I kept. I, I was very nice. I'm like, okay, but what offensive material? He's like, well, you're you're being very sexually graphic. I'm like, 
I'm insinuating. He said, well, there's another joke where you talk about, you, you, you're sort of racist. You talk about people in the inner city. And I said, where? And he, and he described the joke. It's a military joke. I said, I don't say anything about what people I'm talking about. He goes, well, it could be inferred. I'm like, and I said, you can infer anything in anything if you want that to find a way to be a racist. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> that makes you the racist, though, if that's what you do. Right? Like, if you say something innocuous, if you say, I was thinking about poor people and he thinks you mean black people. Yes. That's like, actually, that's not what you said. That's what, that's what he inferred. And that's what I told him. I said, you, it's it's not your fault. And, and I said, I don't, I, I never, I said, show me a joke where I say inner city. And he said, it's inferred. And I, I, I'm, but that's why my favorite joke of all time is, uh, one I came up with where I said I, I was buying a shirt and tie and the clerk said dress for the job you want not the job you have <laughs> which was odd because she was dressed for the body she wanted not to the job she had and some and most audiences laugh but every so often I get someone go mm, mean and then I say yeah she was a very petite woman wearing very baggy clothes and a lot of people even laugh harder and I say oh you thought I was fat shaming didn't you how dare you because they do it in their own mind right. exactly right but anyway, so I got an email yesterday saying, hey, after our conversation, I wanted to let you know that I don't think this is going to work out. We're going to release you from presenting at our function. Um, I hope you understand. And I wrote back and said, actually, I don't understand at all, but it's your decision. Thank you. Because, well, I mean, I kind of do understand. Here's where I'm going with all of this is, and this is just my ego talking. This is the artist getting egotistical uh, where where and not seeing his point of view or belittling him. But I honestly would have respected him more if he had said, here's the deal. Obviously, it's a nothing joke. It's a throwaway. It's fine. You don't say anything wrong. But I work with some, this one pussy fucking complains about everything. And instead of making 200 people happy, I have to make 200 people unhappy and one person happy because that's my job. So I'm sorry. I would have respected that in a weird way, but the way he kept coming at me and, and just saying that I was so evil and wrong because of a joke about penis size, it, it boggled my mind. It, it confounded me because I kept asking him, like, show me or tell me where I've done something wrong and I will correct it. And he kept saying, well, it's inferred. I'm like, People will infer what you said. People will infer, believe whatever they want. So I can't remember. I think well, when you said uh, uh, HR and politically correctness, that's oh, that yeah. where we are at. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I will say this. I was talking to one of my conservative friends. And he said, all this Black Lives Matter stuff, all this stuff, it's it's driving people towards white supremacy, right? Because the, all these people they're they're doing these things, and it's it's turning people like if there's a kid and he's like a white guy, and he said if there's a race war, what am I supposed to do? And I was like, well, I was thinking to myself, well, dickhead, you don't have to pick a side. You could just choose not to pick a side, and say fuck you both. Right, you could you do, just because people are running around saying Black Lives Matter doesn't mean you need to join uh, the the a fucking white militant militia. You right? Me, like, I'm, and I'm sorry, but I've been thinking it for 20 seconds now. If you choose not to decide, you still have made it. I'm thinking Rush in my you know, I I can't sing, but it's like yeah, you have free will. Exactly. Um, fuck, you can choose. Right, right. But that being said. I still stand by that. But I will also say <laughs> that people like that guy you're talking to are the reasons, are part of the reason why people like Trump get elected. Because yep. if you live in a world in which you tell every white male that he is racist, sexist, and a homophobe just by, he's just congenitally fucked up. Because he's a he's white and he's a man, he's a cisgender white male, and then you get a guy like Trump who says, "Fuck that!" 
every stupid thought you have is okay. There is a pull towards that because one side is beating you down with morality that they don't even necessarily live by, right? They beat you down with this. How can you not do this? And how can you not feel shitty for this? And why aren't you doing this? And why aren't you doing this? And you, you know what I mean? I need it's to not okay. I've, I've noticed, by the way, that when, when we uh, talk over one another in the thing, it, it garbles both of us. So that's oh, why I try and okay. wave off. I, I have, I, I can't go into specifics here, but I, I have a friend who told me about a, a, an HR meeting he had um, a couple, like two, three months ago. No, last month. It's December. Thanksgiving. It happened around Thanksgiving. They had a meeting where when it comes to Native American genocide by the hands of white people, they are now supposed to use the terms that say what we did, not what our ancestors did, but inclusive white, this is what we did to the natives. And it's like, no, my great, great grandpa did that. Fuck off. I didn't do it. You know, but they're saying that the language is now, we have to take full responsibility by saying we did this to the natives as opposed to, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm like, don't put it on my back. I will acknowledge that horrible things happened and how can we move forward? Yes. But, you know, is that what you, is it going to go on to my kids? I know you're going to tell my kids who are just born that they will have to say, you did this, you know, where does it end? Yeah. There, I was talking to someone yesterday. I was driving back from, I went to the city yesterday and I was talking to someone on my way back and we were talking about that very thing. I'm, I'm trying to think of the exact context. They had to go to a meeting. Same, same thing. And there's a, my friend's words were a probably not heterosexual man from California came and gave us a lecture that told all of the white people he told everybody that they were racist naturally and there was nothing they could do about it, particularly if they were white and they were men. He happened to be white and a man. And he explained to me what the person said and why they said it based on like media and education and all this other stuff. And I thought about it like in the same way with the Beverly uh, D'Angelo book. What is that her name? Robin. Beverly Robin. D'Angelo was in vacation. Oh, yeah. I was wondering where right. you were going. I was thinking, wait a minute, D'Angelo. Um, Robin D'Angelo, right? Yeah. Isn't that her name? We wrote White I Virginia. can't remember. I, I know who you're talking about. I know. And, that. and here's the thing. They're not wrong. Do you know what I mean? Like, there is something to be said. You could argue that it's just majority rule, right? But when you have a system that says this is beautiful, this is success, this is this, this is this, and it only shows one type of person, that does have an effect, you know? Like Mm -hmm. to act like that doesn't have an effect on the psyche of the world. Like Americans believe that the whole world thinks like us. We believe that everywhere you go, racist things happen in the same exact way they happen here, and they don't. We believe that all around the world, these they happen in their own racist ways. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Right. They have a very, but it's not necessarily between black people and white people or these, it's like they have their own. Chinese people hate Korean people and Korean people hate Japanese people. Filipino people are the worst according to all the other Asian. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like everybody has their own way of doing it. But as Americans, we think that our way is the best. And we think that the way we think is always the best. Right. And, uh, so I was like, you know, there we think is it's something. The, we think it's the best and the worst. We think. Right, simultaneously. That, yeah, we, like, okay, I'm just going to be very broad here, so don't hold me to this. People on the right think America first, America best, we're number one. And people on the far left think we're the worst racist, we're the most horrible, we should feel guilty about everything. And and that's why there's conflict, because we're listening to the two loud, loudest voices that are the yeah. furthest apart. Or yeah. farthest apart. I'm not sure which one I'm supposed yeah. to use there because yeah. I'm dumb. Right. Well, you yeah. know, either one. I know what you mean. Well, I, I think the problem that I have with it is that at the end of the day, 
while that is true, white, I do believe that white supremacy exists. Mm-hmm. I don't think it means what people think it means. It's like defund the police doesn't really mean defund the police, right? White supremacy doesn't mean what people think it means. White, not even white supremacy, white privilege doesn't mean what people think it means. It doesn't mean white people get checks in the mail. Do you know what I mean? It just means that statistically speaking, I'll get a ticket less things, often than you will. Right. Like it, it, it's, and not because what it means is that, that there's a presumption of humanity when somebody sees you. Like you don't have to jump through hoops to prove you're a human. You don't have to jump through hoops to prove that you deserve certain rights and things like that. That I don't feel like I get that all the time. I feel like I oftentimes have to prove that I'm different from other people before someone decides to treat me like a human being. It's, you know? it's Brock Turner getting sentenced to three months for rape when right. Hispanic uh, male was sentenced to something like 10 or 20 years around right. the same time in California right. for exactly. sexual assault right. or something like that. Right. Because Absolutely. the judge looked yeah. at him and said, look at this good kid from a good school. He just you know, made a mistake one night. I'm not going to ruin his life for that. He, the right. judge... Exactly unconsciously sees himself in that white right, kid. Right, absolutely, right. And when he sees absolutely. a brown kid yes. or a black kid, he sees different. And even if his different isn't, um, that kid's a criminal, it's still different. And different is all that matters. And that's yeah, where judgment absolutely. comes in. It, it's, it's like, I want to make sure this person understands. Like I've heard people say, it, and you can, you can never make a one-to-one comparison. Do you know what I mean? Like you can never make a one-to-one comparison. Like, cause I can get pulled over by a cop and the cop can say, boy, I'm going to teach you a lesson not to be driving on these roads. And he can give me a four point ticket when he could have just given me a warning, you know, and, or take a two point ticket and make it a four point ticket, you know, which is more likely what happened more. When I think about it, that's more what happened is even I, I might've been doing something wrong but it was always made out to be significantly more than what it was. And I think they did that to everybody. Honestly, I think it was just a way to get you to plea bargain when you went into the court to fight it. You just took the thing and paid the, well, if I will knock two points off, it's like, yeah, cause you fucking added them on dickhead. Right. Of course you'll knock them off. You know what I mean? It's the good old days of uh, your tail lights out. What? No, it's not smash. Yes, it is. Right. 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 And, And I can't argue that that didn't happen to everybody, but when it happened to me, it felt personal. So it felt racist, you know what I mean? But what I will say is to come full circle, what we're talking about is that while I think that white privilege or white supremacy exists, I think black people do a lot to uphold it because black people enforce that blackness is thing a lot too, right? Like I've found in black communities, there's often more support for a white kid who acts black, whatever the fuck that means with my air quotes, you know? Um, right. There's more support for that kid than there is for the black kid who doesn't quote unquote act black. Right. And so black people do a lot to enforce master's rules on each other. Right. Like, like we, like we could get mad at master's rules and the one drop rule makes you black and blah, blah, blah. But then when we flip it around, we want the same kind of thing. And like, cause white supremacy doesn't just affect white people, right? Black people grew up watching the same TV shows. And so there is a sense of like, black people hold, not holding up that wall of separation too, but there is a thing, right? Like where, I don't know how to say it because it's not coming out. I'm having my Kanye moment, right? Where I'm trying to say something that's gonna sound totally fucked up, but I don't mean it that way. It's like, while white supremacy and white privilege exist, they don't mean what people think they mean. And it doesn't mean that white people don't suffer. And it doesn't mean that white people don't have a really hard time. It doesn't mean that white people aren't poor and broke and having a really fucking hard time in life. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that there's a certain thing that you guys don't have to deal with up until now, right? Like up until now, my understanding is that most white dudes didn't have to walk into a room and worry about whether or not they offended somebody. You know what I mean? Like they see, here's what I always hear. We used to be able to tell a joke. It's like, yeah, because back when you told a joke, people pretended that it was funny. You know what I mean? It wasn't really funny. 
we just I just I, I was six, you know what I mean? And you were but, twenty five and so, you know. But then the pendulum swings to the point where Chris Rock is saying, I agree with everything you say. I'm, so maybe yeah. but is the wrong word because that that's a negating word. Um, and also, I suppose, uh, so that way I don't negate what you say since I agree with it. And also it goes to the extreme of Chris Rock saying, I can't perform at a college because if I say that black kid, suddenly I'm being offensive. I have to say that kid with the red shoes. Where Right, exactly. Right. Yeah, it, it's but it it comes down to this simple thing, right? Like the liberals, the conservatives get mad, right? They're getting all mad. Like, how can people start making shit up and making these things up and saying these are the new rules? It's like, oh, where do you think they learned it from, dickhead? Yeah, right. Where do you think they learned it from? Like, we've had uh, several hundred years of made up lies literally being baked into the fabric of this country and becoming the truth. Like being so baked in that it just becomes the accepted reality and it's based on these massive fictions and then using those fictions and those identity politics, but not calling it that, to beat people into submission and create something. And now you're mad that like the children of that looked at that and went, yeah, we're going to do the same thing. We just don't want the same things you want. So we're going to do it this way. We need the same techniques. We can make up a bunch of shit too. And we can beat everybody into shape and yeah. make it so you can't say whatever. You have to say what we want you to say or it, we'll fucking cancel you. And then you cancel it used to be getting lynched or, you know, something else or getting stoned or drowned or any number of things, right? And now it's internet death. You know what I mean? It but, is know? the proverbial Malcolm X chickens coming home to roost. It's, that's it's, exactly what he it, meant. It's a, and this is this is this is where this is what I mean when I say white supremacy is really a thing. It's the assumption that all the only smart stuff came out of Europe, right? That right. only the only and the only high intellectual thought came from these European people or these white American men. Not and so because the 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 brilliant thinkers who are black or who are spent Latinx now, right? Is that what we have to fucking say? Right? I don't mean that in any offensive way, right. but like- I was rolling my eyes at the know, toilet flush, like, not what you were saying. I don't know right, if you heard that. I know, I did. But you know what I mean? Like, like I, know, I know people who are of Hispanic descent who hate the term Latinx. You know what I mean? Like they don't well, want to be called- you they know what I mean? like, I, I, Didn't we talk about this with, with yeah, Dalton? Like, I, Right, the, like what's the, the what's politician, the, the Latino politician yeah. said, "Hey, do you want to communicate? You want to connect the Latin uh, voters? Stop calling us Latinx. Nobody likes it. Nobody Latino likes it. Latino right. is not broken, so don't fucking fix it." Right, right, and, and and who made it up? Right, like a bunch of white college kids sitting around right. decided what Latino should be called, so that well, they because wouldn't they be wanted to be more <laughs> inclusive. I, I don't want, know who made it up. And, I, I don't know. I'm just being silly, well, but. Well, let's go. I do know what you mean, and I and and I, I, I what I'd like to do is I wonder if there's a way to break white supremacy supremacy into two groups because th there are obviously the white supremacy militant groups that are dangerous, right? And Absolutely, in their own sense. But yes. then the overall white supremacy, which you are talking about, which is just a cultural norm, and right, which white it's people don't see did. because we swim in right. it. You don't see the air you breathe, right. but as uh, a, a black person or a person of color or whatever the fuck I'm supposed to call you these days. Right. So I don't exactly. get canceled because I use the wrong thing does see it because you are not me. I, I don't see the air I breathe in, but since you are different, you right. are very aware of it. And for, if I were to deny that it would just be a head up my own ass thing. But it, it and the, but it doesn't. And the thing is that like, it's it's such a baked in assumption that that the brilliant works of women of black people of any of the minority groups that happen to be of color or female generally speaking their works were not ever read or treated seriously or anything like that and because of that you have people who were in the 1800s and early 1900s and in the fucking 60s and the 50s and the 20s and the 10 whatever you have all these people throughout history 
who have been saying, listen, if we do not deal with this problem, it's going to turn into this. And they pointed to what we're going through now. And everybody seems so shocked, like, oh my God, it's new stuff. It's like, it's like, you know, we just scientifically proved that acupuncture works. So now you can do it. Really? They've been doing it for 5,000 years. So because a couple of like white doctors said it, it works, now all of a sudden everybody, it works. You know what I mean? Right? Like, you know, uh, that could be a silly example because I don't actually know if it really works or not. I'm making that shit up. Right? <laughs> but it sounds good. <laughs> But you know what I mean? It's like shit like that. That's what white supremacy is. It's that things aren't valid until some white person gives it the stamp of approval because there's an assumption that it's that that, that stamp of approval should mean more than everybody else's. And what I think is happening now is that we're so used to that, but women are saying and people of color are saying and 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 the LGBTQ plus community is saying, like, hey, wait, our stamp matters too now. And that's what it seems like that's what people are fighting for, for their stamp of approval being the best. It seems like everybody wants their stamp to be included in whether or not something is good or not. Well, you know what I mean? Back it up one sentence. I was yeah. going to say everyone should be included, but I agree with what you said. And we have talked about this in the past and there's no need to go down this path any further because I mean, at least not tonight we're, we're we'll get very long in the tooth but you use the word best. And I think that's where the issue is coming in, where it's not um, just because I'm stupid, I'll use a a, a phrase. It's not all artistic voices matter. It's my voice is the most important because of, and then the history that they say reflects it. it, It's a matter of um, who can out victim the other person, the other, the other group, and and I tried, I don't know if we talked about this, I tried reading a, a, a book recently that was about um, whatever, race relations, and I stopped three pages in because one of the things it said was, I chose to write about this topic because this group of people is the, has been historically the most marginalized and oppressed group of people of all time. And that's where I was done because it's like, okay, I'm sure Jewish people would have words on that. I'm sure uh, black women women would have words about that. I'm sure the LGBTQ community would. And it's like, instead of saying this focused group has had it the worst, that doesn't add anything. You know, a, a lot of people have been severely fucked over. And if you really pull back and examine it, it usually boils down to the wealthy and the not wealthy and the wealthy use tricks to make us all hate one another on this end and believe the other is at fault for it. Absolutely. And it's, we're still playing it to this day. We're playing the game of and, it's your fault. It's your fault. I've had it worse. I'm a victim. And what we're absolutely. seeing now is it's coming around to the point where it is my fault. I'm the white male. So now we're going to exclude you and everything is your fault just because the rich white men have had the power. So suddenly middle class or, you know, guy that grew up white trash and on welfare is to blame just because right. I'm me. I'll, yeah. I'll take it on my shoulders. I, it's my fault, everyone. I bring it on. Well, I can take it. But here's the thing. Here's what's funny about that. And this is where it's funny because like, I, as a, like, this is, again, it comes back to this thing, right? Like I can remember being young and hanging out with, you know, a bunch of people of color and, somebody would do something stupid and somebody else would go, see, that's why they don't like us because you do stuff like that. Right. That's why they think we're this because, because you do this. And there is this idea that as a black person, I literally have all black people's fate on my shoulders. And when I do something wrong, it makes it harder for another black man who might be 150 miles away because if I do it, I speak for all people. And white people never really had to go through that because all serial killers are white and yet nobody thinks that all white people are dangerous. Not, do you know uh, what I mean? uh, not fuck, I can't think of his name. The Atlantic the sniper. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, not just and him. The sniper. And the and sniper. The right? sniper. And uh, look it up on yeah. 60 Minutes. The most prolific serial killer of all all time 
uh, within the past year confessed to so many hooker murders. Black guy. So, you know, well, there you go. So we're like with up. sports, nice. you guys dominate. Once you do it, you do it. <laughs> No, what you just made me think of, and let's sign off, is you made me think of um, The People versus OJ, which was a great miniseries. And I don't think, I don't remember, but the whole point is OJ worked his, according to the series, and this is just fiction, and whole life to fit in. And the instant, I mean, murder is a pretty fucked up thing to do, but he was cast out immediately. Like you can work your whole life to fit into white society as a black person, but you will get cast out at the first moment now again murder is pretty good reason to cast anyone out but yeah but they, they yeah, we also cast off charles uh, manson and he was white mm. yeah i suppose <laughs> i mean i but i wonder you know like i often wonder that with like well, 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 wonder. i wonder turn everything into a reference now because my brain well, is though. turning to mush at this point well like when woody allen was banging his daughter <laughs> like he got cast out he has been canceled he did he did. I felt like people were far more lenient on him based on a technicality than they were on Michael Jackson back when they didn't actually think Michael Jackson did it. If that makes sense. Yeah, you know that makes I mean? sense. But I, think- like, I feel like nowadays people are like, oh, I'm not sure he might have did that shit, you know? And so people, like, they won't. But back in the day, I feel like Woody Allen got over. He didn't get over, but I think he got better treatment than I think Michael Jackson did at a time when people still thought he was innocent, you know. But I could just. But it, I, that but could be it, another path for another day. I hear what you're saying. I, I, I yeah, won't argue points. But, I, no, I, but, I don't disagree, I'll, but I also. I'll, I'll say this, just to close, to sign mm-hmm. off. I'll say this. You know, when the cops shot John Crawford in Ohio, that same cop killed a white guy a couple of months earlier. When the kid, when the cop shot Trayvon Martin, he had shot somebody else. He already had been fired from the police force Wait. for disciplinary actions. Not Trayvon Martin. Didn't Zimmerman um, shoot Martin? No, no, I'm sorry, not Trayvon Martin. Okay. Um, the young kid. Tamir Rice, the the, okay. the, the, the young boy who yeah. got killed, and uh, after that, that so that cop, that cop had killed somebody else, or not killed somebody, had been fired from the force, fired from his previous police force for inappropriate use of force, and blah 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 blah, and a white kid got killed for the same by a cop for using a toy gun a few months later, and what dawned on me is that like. If white people cared about white people, this stuff wouldn't happen. Because if they got rid of the cop when he had done something to a white person and stopped and stopped acting like you know what I mean, instead instead of just like acting like it doesn't happen, you know what I mean? Because like white guys will make jokes about it, like what am I black guy? They're not gonna shoot me, right? Like it's like a joke, right? But they do shoot white guys, maybe disproportionately. Who, right? I don't know. Maybe they disproportionately kill black people. That's what they say. But I don't, but I think that like it could, maybe it is racist to a degree, but it might be less racist and more just bad police culture, right? Like some things that may, that may appear to be racist to me might just be, I met an asshole who happened to be white, right? right? Like I'm not sure every interaction between black people and white people that is negative is racist. You know what I mean? I'm not sure that that's true, even though that is something that I might have assumed for many, many years of my life. I'm not sure it's as true as I think it is. You know what I mean? I don't I'm know. not anyway, sure how you're tying this to Michael Jackson and Woody Allen, because that was your jumping off point. <laughs> what, I, what I mean is um, that, like, assuming that, that, is that, that that's racism, it may not be. Do you mm. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm a, like, like, the assumption that, like, Woody Allen got better treatment because he's white and Michael Jackson got then Michael Jackson did when even when we weren't sure he did it or not, you know, and we knew Woody Allen was banging his daughter. You know, we knew that because we saw them holding hands and making movies about it. I mean, I mean, not 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 to split hairs, but uh, gross. But she was 19 or something like that. So it was like gross 
but legal as opposed to little boys and never still his daughter oh it's still the problem is that, that's um, that's the trump that's the trump thing right like if it's not written down to say it's illegal then i can do it just be, if it could be immoral and fucked up and everything else it's fucking wrong what he did it's i know it's wrong, wrong. it's well, fucking wrong not and gross. i won't i'm not even okay, she's trying 50. even remotely <laughs> right. but but that was the technicality he got off on yeah and she's not technically his daughter and technically she's and, 19 you know, which is still right. a baby which is still i mean the uh, yeah, there's a world of uh, difference dude. between 13 and 19 there's a world of difference but when you get to be 40 and you look back at 19 you're like you're still pretty fucking stupid i mean i i played a i've played a college within the past couple of years and i was like who are all these children and how do they get into college i see I was like, what 10 year olds here? driving cars and my wife is like no no they're 16 i'm like no they're 10 that is easily a 12 year old <laughs> all right let's not keep going down paths <laughs> I'm going to have to edit this shit out of this because of that big yeah, fuck up with Chrome. Fine. But, uh, it's fine. Yeah, it's good yeah. to talk to you, man. Good to talk yeah. to you. All right, yeah, my friend. Stay out of trouble. Yeah, I'll talk to you in a minute. If you watched <laughs> this and you liked it, share it. Indeed. <laughs> I'll see you later.